Welcome. Today I'm talking with Esther Jenkins, someone I've known for a very long time and have a great respect for, not only for the incredible work that she does, but for the kind of person she is. I love her dearly. I hope you get to know her better. Bye. Thank, thank you, Anita. <laughs> and thank you, Alan, for coming to my home and doing this video for me and for my website. I really appreciate it. So I was going to start out by saying uh, I've wanted to share this information with people for a long time in general. I've been sharing it with many of my students, mm -hmm. but it's not in the general public. And I really think it would be helpful if they understood the kind of work I do and more of the details of it. Absolutely. So um, I'd like to say I'm a shamanic healer, teacher and counselor, but uh, my work in healing is a bit unique because I use many modalities. I use energy healing, of course, but I also use shamanic techniques. So I might use whistles and rattles. And also I'm using techniques that I've learned over the years from both Jungian psychology, but also something called voice dialogue. Mm -hmm. In the shaman's world, the primary goal in healing is always <clears throat> soul retrieval. Mm -hmm. That's the primary aspect. Are you so, going to describe that a little bit? I am. Um, in, in shamanism, there are many forms of soul retrieval, I have found. But I found it interesting that the form I used was actually used by the Andean people, the Peruvian people that I uh, went to in a couple of, many years ago, actually. I traveled to Peru many times. And I found that they were doing similar work, that is soul retrieval, mm -hmm. by uh, reparenting the inner child. And they did it in a, such a unique way, it just astonished me. They took the clothing of the person, like their jacket, for example, and they wrapped it up in a way that made it look like a child. Mm -hmm. And they did many prayers, they did ceremony, and they had the individual hold that child. And basically to be with that child for about 48 hours, speaking to it, loving it, showing it attention and affection which is exactly what I was doing at home in mm -hmm. my healing practice. Uh -huh. And I, I could not believe it, but I think this concept goes back, I don't know how many millennial. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it goes back into ancient times that people understood that in order to heal, you have to heal these inner parts of yourself. Otherwise, the healing doesn't stick. When I, when I talk about soul retrieval to some people, they think it's like actual parts of their soul are ripped away and lost. And well, I just, that's not, that's a bit of a misconception. Well, correct? not really. It's pretty close, actually. <laughs> what happens in the Andean tradition, wherever you have a trauma, mm -hmm. you, you have soul loss. Mm -hmm. This is primarily the way they understand soul loss. Mm -hmm. It's around trauma. And children all grow up with trauma. Mm -hmm. So that every time you have a trauma, a piece of the soul doesn't actually go away in the traditional sense of the word. That's what people think. But it, in their tradition, they say it actually goes into the land. Oh. And so when you have a soul retrieval in Peru, mm -hmm. for example, they want to take you back to the place where the soul loss took place oh. and recuperate or recover the soul pieces that were embedded in the land. And that might sound terribly far-fetched. But when you think about it, you see people wherever there's been trauma, where a shooting has occurred, what do they do? Mm -hmm. They put flowers, they put mm -hmm. all kinds of pictures. The, they know that a part of the soul is there, even though the body has been taken away. Mm. They understand that somehow intuitively. Mm -hmm. And that's the same concept. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, in, what do yeah. you do if you can't go back to the place? Where... So then you journey. Uh -huh. And I take the individual on a journey to the exact place where the trauma occurred mm -hmm. and the soul is then reunited that soul part is reunited with the individual mm -hmm. and then we take them to a new place so they no longer have to go back there and re-experience the same trauma over and over and mm -hmm. over so in the work um though i've talked about various things i use chakras are important we do chakra cleansing uh, journey work is critical. That's very much a part of this. As I was saying earlier, one of the interesting things is that I learned was many times the traditional soul retrieval is the shaman goes on, this, on the journey, huh. the shaman finds the soul part, 
the shaman brings the soul part back and blows it into the individual. Mm -hmm. I didn't find that effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason is the individual is not involved in the reparenting of this soul part, and it needs to be reparented. You want to just explain reparented a little bit? What does so, that mean? What I mean that just looks briefly. Like, yeah, what it looks like is when you go back to find the original situation, mm -hmm. you actually separate the child, as in it's almost always a child that has the deepest wounds. There are mm -hmm. teenagers too. And you stop the perpetrator from continuing the abuse. Mm -hmm. So you step into the picture as the adult and you step between the child and the, the parent usually, and you tell them, no, this is never going to happen again. Okay. You're not allowed any longer to mm -hmm. abuse this child. Mm -hmm. And then the child feels that they have an advocate, mm -hmm. which they never had when they were that age. Mm -hmm. and Or maybe they did, but that, that was the rare case that a grandparent or an aunt or something would step in. And on top of that, you have to sever the connection between the child and the parent. And this may be the hardest part to understand. The adult doesn't have to sever that tie be to, to the parent, but the child does. Right. This is similar to some NLP work. That yes. We do. So when you do that, you say to the parent, I, I used to be more aggressive, and I would say, you can never, you know, m much more abrupt and much more, uh, let's say, harsh. Mm -hmm. But now I realize, of course, the parent is doing what they're doing because they don't know better, yeah. or they don't get it, or they have no consciousness. So we say to them, you are no longer responsible for this child. Mm. And we say to the child, this is your new mother and father, and she or he will take you to a new place mm -hmm. where you can get the love and affection and the security that you need. Hmm. So that particular part of the process is extraordinarily important because the inner children keep looking for a parent. Right. And that's the relationship they have with the world. They either have it as a friend or a partner, but it always has to take the place of the parent <clears throat> that they could never have that healing experience with. Uh -huh. So that's why this is so critical. Right. And adding to that, the process goes like this. In the beginning, I found that just talking to the individual, getting their history, getting a feeling for where they're coming from and asking them what they wanted to heal, mm -hmm. we could get enough information to start the shamanic soul retrieval. But I also recognized that I would get resistance. Yes. I get a lot of resistance. <laughs> and then I remembered something. I remembered that I had worked with a man by the name of Hal Stone mm -hmm. uh, and his wife, Sidra, and I had taken many, many courses with them on voice dialogue, which I found extraordinarily helpful. Mm -hmm. And are you familiar with voice yes. dialogue? A little. Well, yeah. A little. Well, in this case, many of you may not be, but in that case, they find that there are these, I call them the children. He, he would call a vulnerable child the child. He would call the critic the critic, mm -hmm. the pusher, the pleaser, <laughs> the protector, controller, right. but yeah. not necessarily give them an age. Mm -hmm. What I discovered is they all came in early on, mm -hmm. and they all took a role. And the protector controller is usually around seven years old. Mm -hmm. Well, a seven-year-old is only capable of protecting you in the way a seven-year-old would protect you, Correct. which is either shut down and, and become invisible mm -hmm. or get extraordinarily angry and create chaos. Mm -hmm. In most, And then there's, of course, gradations in between. So their, their way of dealing is to make sure that the vulnerable child is safe. That's their prime, that's the prime directive for the Star <laughs> Trek people, which I am. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and so that being the case, that becomes the only consideration and the and the adult in the picture doesn't get to do a lot or say a lot mm -hmm. before they realize somebody has taken over and oh my god i'm i'm creating something very very uh, that i feel i don't like mm -hmm. and it, it makes me feel guilty and ashamed after the fact because i've yelled i've screamed i ran away whatever i did right. so the the adult is primarily the conscious mind and the mm -hmm. children are the emotions. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that my first teacher taught something called Huna. Yes. 
But he was teaching Max Freedom Long's version of Huna. Not, That's the one I'm familiar not with. Not Haponopono, Panapana, that one. <laughs> and although that's a part of, of the mm-hmm. ancient teachings. And in that, they described you, a, a, individuals, as being a triune being. Mm. You have an Unahipali, which was the low self. You have an Uhani, which is the middle self. And you have an Amakua, which is the high self. Mm-hmm. But the added caveat was, these are two souls and a spirit. Mm-hmm. And I came back from being a P teacher, a scientific background, and they're telling me, my first teacher, that what, I'm two souls and a spirit? Uh-huh. What the, you know, it went right over my head and I go, oh, uh, no. <laughs> but I said, I like the idea, the concept that I can think of unconscious, conscious, and super conscious. The ancient Egyptians that. had a similar Yeah, I get that. However, <laughs> if you really look at this and if you understand multiple personality disorder, you are really talking to individuals that appear to have no connection to the ego, which of course is not aware. Mm-hmm. It, there is no ego as, su- as such. There's no core personality. So, and they can have diseases. Mm-hmm. One, some pers- one of the uh, multiples will have a disease, the other one doesn't. It's fascinating. How is that possible? Yes. <laughs> so the idea of two souls and a spirit become mm-hmm. much more, hmm, maybe, maybe. And if that's the case, the way the Huna teachings go, it's your responsibility to bring up the child. Mm-hmm. When you are capable of bringing the child up to the level of you as a middle self, then you can go on to become a high self. And that's how it moves forward. So we've been doing this for a while. If that's the case, when I'm dealing with my child, the more I separate from that part of myself, the better opportunity I have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. If I don't separate, I can't help. Mm -hmm. And that requires what Hal would call an aware ego. Oh, yeah. Now, he's, of course, background is Jungian psychology. which it's my background, too. My background. I studied it even though I never took it officially. And it all of a sudden began to make sense. So how do we do that? What we do in the beginning of the work is, in the beginning of a session, is we have to get the protector controller mm-hmm. on our side. The protector controller can block you mm-hmm. as the therapist slash counselor, th- whatever you are. And I hope that other people uh, in the therapeutic community will find some of this interesting. Um, how could they not? How could they not, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is they're simply trying to protect the inner child, mm-hmm. the, the vulnerable child. And so what you do is you, I would talk to them over time and then they begin to trust me Mm -hmm. so that we can move forward at that point and then you have to ask permission may I talk to some of the other sub-personalities usually one of them will come forward one of the children will come forward and make their feelings known Mm -hmm. and it could be shame or guilt or anger and that's where we go we go to the point of who shows up and we begin to find out what was going on in their life at that time. And this is the way we find the parts that need to be rescued. Mm-hmm. Because there's a, an event that occurred that created this soul loss and this trauma. And that shows up as guilt and shame and anger. And it also shows up as dysfunction. So every time a situation occurs in the adult's life where for no reason... Something is said or something happens and you are triggered and you don't understand why what you've got is one of these inner children. Mm-hmm. And that's why you don't understand why, because you don't remember the situation. Right. And so you have no clue as to why you're overreacting. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards you get to think about it and you thought, why did I do that? You know, it's <laughs> stupid. Why in the world would I let that happen? Mm-hmm. Do you have a question or something? You no. Want? Okay. Not right. yet. I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> if I do, I'll, I'll interrupt oh, you. Oh, let me know. <laughs> okay. So, so that tells you right there that when a part of you is acting out, you're talking about a disowned piece of yourself or one that at least is not consciously available. Now, this is very similar to what we do in NLP called parts party, mm-hmm. where you have a negotiation and you bring in the parts that need work and 
often it's guilt and shame and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. that same thing. And and here's what happens mm -hmm. at that point. I I would say we need to rescue the six year old and the ten year old mm -hmm. because they're both really suffering and really are blocking your ability to move forward, which mm -hmm. is most of the time what people find. They get stullified and they can't move forward. So then we I put them on my table, and then I start doing the energy work. And you mean the, like a, 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 a an energy, like a, not like a dining room table? No, no, ma the massage table that okay. I have in here <laughs> that we took out for this purpose. Right. And so I then begin to do energy work, which is the work I've, I learned with Rosalind Briere, because that begins to move the energy. Mm -hmm. And I also am doing chakra cleansing at the time, so we can clear enough heavy energy so that they can become fully... Uh, available to mm -hmm. the shift mm -hmm. and as I'm doing the energy work I'm having them go back in time and that's where they discover their inner child uh, yeah. so that's part of this process and then we go through a process where they rescue them they take them to a new house mm -hmm. that they build the child and the adult build together that child then picks a special place and they begin to decorate it and set it up the way they want it uh, and it could be outside, it could be inside. Mm -hmm. And that becomes their new family structure. Hmm. As we bring more children to the table, teenagers as well, they begin the work themselves to reparent these children. And it becomes a regular process. So how long does a, a process like this take? Let's say someone comes to you and they yeah. have, uh, they feel like there's a brick wall, they can't move forward because of let's say something that they always feel guilty yeah. if they're if they're being ambitious or if they're usually I find this with women if she for example says well I, you know I want to be more assertive in my mm -hmm. work I want to get ahead but I feel I feel guilty or ashamed because I, I hear the mother my mother's voice saying ladies are demure and they take orders or whatever right no know? no that's a perfect so, example so what if someone came to you like that how long how long a process well, on I, average because I know it can't you can't give a definitive well y you can do this though I immediately find that inner child we just mm -hmm. go to the instance where what usually I do is say is tell me the first time you felt that way mm -hmm. go back as far as you can and if they couldn't remember? Oh, I have never had a problem. Really? Okay, <laughs> good. Good. Maybe at first, and then it shows up okay. very, very quickly. So because the information is in there. It, it is. Yeah. And the minute we get there, and they hear that child, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. And when they separate, there's another aspect to voice dialogue that I didn't mention. After we talk to a variety of different of subpersonalities, they stand behind the chair mm -hmm. and pull out energy from all of them, and they just become an observer. So you were asking how long it takes. It's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. I've had people have uh, phenomenal events occur within the first session, mm. and by the third session, they're already functioning in a different way. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's completely amazing. That's why I decided to add the voice dialogue work mm -hmm. to the inner child work and, and the journey work so that it, it, it makes it more uh, dynamic. They get it now when they see a kid acting out because they don't feel like it's really them, but something's going on. Mm -hmm. And now they're beginning to understand. Now they can take the process over. So they don't have to come to me for the rest of their lives. They can actually begin to do their inner child. They, I expect they will do inner child work. But also they might find soul parts that never showed up hmm. during the session. And if they hmm. want, I suggest they come back and we can work on it. Or they can do it themselves. I encourage them to do this. It's, uh -huh. it's, once you understand the process, it's, it's not rocket science. It really isn't. So, but what I'm, what I'm impressed by is you have taken a lot of traditions mm -hmm. and put them together in a cohesive whole that you... This is the interesting yeah, part. You have sort of a unique way of working. And it needs yeah. to have a name. It has a name. I haven't yet figured it out. Esterism. It, Esterism. <laughs> there you go. I used to make something called... Uh, Schumann's French toast. That was a dietetic thing. I didn't use any butter, <laughs> but but that was my maiden name. So in in, in, in this process, the mm. the work itself is um, simple enough mm -hmm. that people don't find it overwhelming. That's nice. There is an aspect of it, however, that can be overwhelming, and this is what we call the angry part. Uh. The angry part of us 
if we keep suppressing it over time becomes as big as the room mm -hmm. and then it becomes demonic and I, I i know that term kind of frightens people but it's i don't because people think of it in a in a religious kind i of suppose way. yes and it isn't that yeah. it just becomes overwhelmingly um self-contained mm -hmm. and autonomous right and when it does that it becomes very volatile and it's very hard to control and so what happens is people become very cautious mm -hmm. about being connected emotionally in any way at all. Mm -hmm. They shut down completely Correct. because yeah. the fear is this monster will come out and cause havoc. Mm -hmm. And if that be the case, the longer you wait to, to work with this part, the more problematic it becomes. And sometimes it does come out, like in road rage. Oh, yes, it does. I mean, perfectly nice people get on the road oh, and yes. they just turn into monsters. And it's because somehow this allows it to come out. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we discover the original trigger. Mm -hmm. And with children, this happens frequently that in their dreams they have monsters chasing after them. Uh -huh. This is really this suppressed anger. And we do work, I work with the adults to help the child because there's a way of, of working with it to minimize it mm -hmm. and to be have, and for the child to have control of the situation because the monster becomes very manageable once you face it. Yes. However, if you already have somebody inside that's demonic, <laughs> then you have to use different, different modalities. I never suggest a client work with one, their angry part if it's become overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But we bleed off the energy first by working with the guilt and the shame that hmm. shows up in the children, once you bleed that off, once you convert that, once that becomes a different experience for the child, there isn't the necessity for the anger. And so the angry one steps back for a while and mm -hmm. watches the process and eventually joins the group. Uh -huh. And then we can talk to them. And they have a right to be angry. We don't we don't vilify any of these different parts. Everything is in there for a reason. Exactly. Even if it's sort of distorted it over time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So understanding that you can't make it die, you can't make it disappear. It's going to stay there. It's going to mm -hmm. differ. It'll you know change modalities. It'll shape shift, but it's still still going to be there, and so mm -hmm. it still needs to be worked with. Yeah. So essentially, that's the work. And that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's the work I, I started on myself. Uh -huh. And I'll tell a little story, and I think we'll, we'll kind of end with that. I was very, very angry. I had been angry and been angry most of my life. And it was because the mother that I had was unavailable. She had a nervous breakdown and was emotionally unavailable. My father was shut down. Mm -hmm. And so the anger was not being seen, not being heard, not, not feeling acceptable. And also because I acted out a lot, I was ADD and dyslexic. Ooh. So there you are. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, everything in life was uh, stressful and there was a lot of dysfunction. And finally, now I'm in my 50s at this point at the Healing Light Center Church, I am so angry at my healer because she isn't giving me what I want because I want her to be my mother and she's not going to do that. Uh -huh. And uh, I go out and I can tell you where I was and what I was doing. And I'm on a street corner and finally I've had it up to here and I can't do this anymore. And I just say, never again. That's all. Never again. And what I mean by that is never again am I going to expect that from anybody. Uh -huh. And my inner demonic side knew what I meant mm -hmm. and it went ballistic it you know the only thing missing was me my head turning mm -hmm. otherwise it was the exorcist <laughs> and I went home no and pea I, soup huh? <laughs> I put on a tape recorder because uh -huh. that's what we used in those days oh yes I remember and those. <laughs> I began to let that angry one out and I swear to gosh what I heard coming out of my mouth was just awful. Oh, dear. And it ranted and it raged. Uh -huh. And this went on for an hour. And then I got exhausted. And I was struggling with this part for probably 48 hours. Ooh. At the end of 48 hours, because I held my ground, and I didn't mm -hmm. understand what I was doing, I had actually become the aware ego. I had become separate from everything mm -hmm. with determination at a 10. And when I, when I finally understood that it could not overpower me any longer, it backed away. Yeah, in uh, Kabbalistic Tarot, that's the um, 
the strength card. Oh, yes, my Leo <laughs> card. Yes, it is, which, of course, I am. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it took supreme effort and absolute determination and focus. Mm. I, don't, I don't think that's the best way to do it, but I didn't have any other means. Nobody around me knew. <laughs> and so in a it year's time, I noticed that every reaction I had had in the past, it, it got much better very quickly, but within a year, I saw that I was not reacting any longer to figures mm -hmm. that I had had those expectations with. Mm. And it only gets better and better. That's fascinating. So, it, uh, so basically, story. we converted uh -huh. the ego to an aware ego, mm -hmm. and that changed my life. Wow. So that's what I wanted <laughs> to share with everybody today. And thank you so oh. much. And Are thank we... you for watching. And you can reach Esther at... Esther um, Shaman at earthlink.net. And you'll see my website is School for the Shamanic Arts. Dot com, uh, and or you can call me mm -hmm. at 626-335-1018. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Alan. I really appreciate this. And thank you for watching again.